Good morning, East Sparta Church of God. Yes. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? I hope that you came to worship him this morning. Do I have anybody that's been redeemed in here this morning? Amen. That's what this first song is all about, celebrating our redemption through him. Y'all stand and worship with us. What does it mean to be saved? Isn't it more than just a prayer? Get your blood pumping, won't it? Woo, Lord, I am redeemed. Glory to God. Hey, if you're here for your first time, if you're here visiting, hey, folks, we just want you to fall in here and just worship with us. And just make yourself at home, okay? And, and glory to God, we do have some visitors today, and, and uh, it's always a blessing to see new faces through the door. Amen. I, I tell you something, uh, a lot of times I say, you're glad to be in the Lord's house. Well, in Sunday school this morning, uh, we was talking, and you know, we are so, so, so blessed to be sitting on padded pews in a nice building with electricity. Because we was talking about in other countries how people had to go underground, look over their shoulder to serve the Lord. And, you know, that just hit home for me today. I just thought, Lord, here we drive up in big, nice, fine vehicles with heaters and air conditioners. And, and you know, uh, and 
I don't know. I still find stuff to grumble about a little bit. You know what I mean? And uh, But glory to God, I'm telling you, we're just so blessed. Amen. Hey, if our ushers will come forward this morning, this is just a time that we can give back a small portion of our earnings through our tithes and our offerings, Lord. And uh, I, I tell you, you just can't outgive God. I mean, he and he is just so good to us. Brother Don, would you stand up and say the blessing over the offering this morning, please? Amen. Glory to God. Hey, as they're taking up the offerings this morning, I do have just a few quick announcements. Uh, hey, they're, they're just asking. We, we do have some decorations out in the foyer. We're, they're just asking, you know, if people just please leave them alone because, hey, they're just being moved and they're finding them everywhere and, and it just takes a little time to get them back put up. And uh, it's just, uh, so. But anyway, today is the last day to turn in your pictures for the Mother's Day slideshow. So at this point, I guess it would just be good to see Brother Caleb. And just go ahead and, and talk to him about that. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I love that guy. Amen. I do. If you, know, you have to, issues getting your pictures emailed, I've had a lot of questions about that. Since today is the last day, I will make myself available starting at 3 p.m. over in my office right across the hall here. For anyone who's having issues with that, come and see me. But that will be your last opportunity. Um, so 3 p.m. today, bring your hard copies of your photos, and I'll help you get them scanned in. Amen. Glory to God. There you are. All right. And another announcement we have here, the teens and our children are still practicing at 430 every Sunday afternoon for the Mother's Day song that they'll be singing. And that's taking place in room 215A, okay? Uh, I'm sure that we're going to be in for a blessing to hear that song as well. And we're just thankful for the, the time and uh, the effort that's put into that as well. Amen. Um, also, the ladies, if you are going on the retreat, today you have a meeting at 430, and they're asking if you are going to make sure that you're there. Right, Sister Betty? All right. Pardon? In the fellowship hall. All right. I want to make sure I got that right, because now I'm going to tell you something. She'd get on me afterwards, wouldn't you? I love you. <laughs> I do. And also, uh, we just want to let everybody know that our nursery is back up and running. That is from newborns to age two. Um, that is in room A135. It's just right around the corner. Um, you know, um, it's good to see that back up and going. That, that shows a little bit of normalcy getting back to going here. And also at this time, we have uh, Brother Philip and Christy. They're going to come up and honor the graduates. Amen. Hey, and also, folks, hey, listen, I, I just want to touch on this because this is an awesome little piece of paper right here. Uh, our information sheet, if you didn't get one, make sure you get one on the way out. It has all the events. Also, it has May's calendar on the back of it. Uh, you can hang it on your refrigerator, and you'll be ready to go, okay? Thanks, brother. This morning, we just want to take a few moments to uh, recognize our graduating seniors that we have here at East Florida Church of God. We have four. Two of them are with us this morning, Morgan and Colton. Uh, Brady and Clayson are both working. They said they wanted to be here, but they're with us in spirit. And we, the church uh, has uh, some Bibles that they wanted to present to them as gifts. Um, and I just had a, a, a few things that I wanted to say to, to, to you all. Um, just some scripture. First two you guys are well familiar with uh, 1 Timothy 4.12 don't let anyone despise your youth right but be an example to the believers in word in conduct in love in faith in spirit in purity you guys we've talked about that a whole lot we changed the name to 412 youth ministry uh, we have inundated them with those verses uh, but don't let anyone despise you not only for your youth but for anything know who you are in and through Christ Jesus and be comfortable and confident in that uh, the second one, again, I harp on this a lot, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. This isn't me saying this. This isn't the church saying this. The Lord is saying this. He has plans for you, not to harm you, but for a future, for prosper, right, for good. 
He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be safe. He wants you to be prosperous. Find and take comfort in that, knowing whatever's going on, God has a plan for you, and it's a good plan. It's for you to be healthy and successful. Find comfort in that. Some advice for you. Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on the things above, not on things of this earth. As a young man, I failed at this. Um, I set my mind on things that I wanted to achieve when I was your age. And I'll tell you, I checked them all off. I checked off all the boxes. I did everything that I wanted to do. But just like Solomon in the book of his Ecclesiastes, I found no contentment and no satisfaction in those things. You will only find comfort, peace, joy, satisfaction, and contentment in what you find in that word. Know that. Embrace that. And no matter what happens, Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid or terrified of anything, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you and never forsake you. He's always going to be there. Trust in him. Lean on him. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this, that who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Understand that. We're going to have setbacks. That's life. But God began a good work in you. I promise you, he will equip you so that he can finish it in you. Don't give up on him or yourself because he won't. And he will never, ever leave you or forsake you. Lastly, our prayer for both of you and for Brady and Clayson. Psalms 24, may he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. Guys, we love you and we just want you to continue to be uh, successful in all that you do. And please know that we're always here for you, whatever you have need of. We love you. Amen. Y'all remain standing with us. I don't know about y'all, but if you remember back to whenever you were in school, coming through it on the other side feels like victory, doesn't it? Well, that ain't the only thing we have victory over. We have victory over Satan today because God is fighting for us. Y'all know this one. Sing it with us this morning. Come on, victory.
Come on and give him some praise in his house this morning. Come on and praise him like you've already got the victory this morning. You know, I love those old choruses. They're so simple to sing, but there's still power in them. There is power of life and death in our tongue. And if you believe that this morning, whatever you may be going through, whatever you may need, if it's peace, joy, victory, deliverance, healing, it's yours. All you got to do is claim it. So this morning, as we come into the house of the Lord with thanksgiving and praise in our hearts, we come lifting every praise to a God who is worthy of that and so much more. A God who never needs us to cry out his praise because all of creation, all of the galaxies and universes are already doing it. But we are privileged to be able to come and join in with them. So this morning, Lord, we pray that as we focus our hearts and our minds on you, that you would cover us with your blood, that you would wash us clean. Lord, that you would prepare us and that you would find our sacrifice of praise worthy of your presence this morning, that you would come and commune with your people, that you would come and restore us, that you would come and lift us up. God, that you would come and bring us peace, that you would show us victory. Father, that you would heal these fleshly broken vessels, Lord, and make them exactly what you need them to be. This morning, we offer every praise. Have your way in this place.
Let the worshippers arise Let the sons and the daughters fantastic work in the revival this last week glory to God and the last word that was given on Wednesday night was about the coming of the Lord and I'm going to build on top of what brother Joel started Wednesday night go with me in two places first of all Zechariah chapter 8 verse 16 and 17 and then we're going to go to Nahum verse 1, 5 and 6 Zechariah chapter 8 says these are the things you shall do say that to your neighbor these are the things you shall do speak each man the truth to his neighbor give judgment in your gates for truth, justice and peace let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor. 
And do not love a false oath. Well, get this. For all these are things I hate, says the Lord. Nahum chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. The mountains quake before him, the hills melt, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it, who can stand before his indignation, and who can endure the fierceness of his anger. His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. I want to minister this morning on the subject, warnings from the Dead Sea. Warnings from the Dead Sea. You'll get this in a minute. Stretch your hands this way and let's pray. Father, Lord, as we come before your presence this morning, we thank you. Father, for another opportunity to be in your house today, Lord, to preach your word and to hear your song sung, Lord, and to feel your presence. Now, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would allow us to hear this word and take it in. Lord, and hear the warnings of, this, of these scriptures. Father, to see what is taking place in our world today and know that you are soon coming after your church. Father, I pray, God, that if there is anyone in here, Lord, that's lost and don't know you in a free pardon of sin, Lord, you'll save them before this service is over. Father, if there are those who have backed up on you, backslid, Lord, that are cool, cold, Lord, lukewarm. Father, I pray that you'll draw them to this altar, Lord, to restore that relationship before this service is done. Father, I pray that you let us all know that you're soon coming. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, the glory, the honor for it all in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. amen. Glory to God. You may be seated. Warnings from the Dead Sea. On Tuesday, March 16th, 2021, just last month, the Israel Antiquities Authority announced the discovery of two new Dead Sea Scroll fragments. This is an extreme significant find since the last discovery was made 65 years ago in 1956. This recent surprise occurred in what was called the Cave of Horror near the western shore of the Dead Sea. It's the site where insurgents were believed to have hidden during the uprising against the Roman Empire in A.D. 133 to 136. But unlike the other Dead Sea Scrolls which were written in Hebrew and Aramaic, the fragments from the cave of horrors were they contain Greek letters. It's, it's li it likely represents a development or a revision of the standard Greek translation, often referred to as the Septuagint. The, the two fragments contain small sections of verses from the two ver from the two books that I read, Zechariah chapter eight and Nahum. These were the two fragments that were found in that cave. And when you look at what these verses actually say. They appear to address what is happening in the world today and especially in America. You see, I don't believe that it's a coincidence that these Dead Sea Scroll fragments were found at this particular moment in history after 65 years. How many of you believe that God has a timing for everything? I believe they were found right on time, in time, that God wanted them found. You see, I believe the Lord has delivered a warning message to the world, one that says, here's how you need to act, and should you fail to heed my words, then judgment is coming. That's the word of the Lord. Whether we like it or not, that's the word of the Lord. I've only got two points today. First of all, the first point I'm going to take from Zechariah chapter 8. Second point I'm going to take from Nahum chapter 1. The first point that I'm going to deal with is this. Uh, the things uh, we must do. Look at your neighbor and tell them these are the things uh, we must do. How I many of you know that God has commands in his word of how we should act every day of our life? 
God's got things he's already outlined. You can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 10 and you will find the things. These are the things that the Lord requires of us, he says. Glory to God. You can go to to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and go to the very last uh, verses of that that scripture and you'll find that the end, that the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, he said everything else is vanity except for living for the Lord. The end thing, the end result of mankind is to live for God, find God in your youth, and do everything you can to live for the Lord every day of your life. So folks, when I read this scripture out of Zechariah, I find there are some things that we're supposed to do. You see, Zechariah was preaching to the Jews returning from the Babylonian exile. And in these verses, the Lord invites the exiles that are there to make a brand new covenant, amen, with him to establish a brand new relationship, to live differently and more righteously than their former ways which led them into the time of exile. When you look at that word things, he said these are the things you shall do. When you look at that word things there in verse 16, that that, that word also translates words or commandments. It's the same words that is used to describe the ten commandments in Exodus the ten commandments are literally the ten words from God therefore the meaning here can also be these are the commandments you shall do you see the Broadman Bible commentary says the requirements of the covenant are very simple here in Zechariah Lord God, truth in everyday conversation judgment which is which is both factual and makes for peace, an end to mutual conspiracies among the people, and a renewed appreciation for honesty and faithfulness in worship and in every other phase of life. You see, the Bible commentary says that these are very simple. They are very simple, glory to God, for the child of God, but they, glory to God, oh, hallelujah, they are, they're very hard for those who want to live in sin and determine to to deliberately rebel against God. They're hard to follow. But I find four commands in this scripture in Zechariah. And the first command says to speak each man the truth to his neighbor. What are you talking about, folks? Lord God, see, all you have to do is turn on the TV and watch the major news networks to see how lying seems to be the norm today. They couldn't tell the truth if it was right in front of them on a screen. Oh, come on now. Not only that, but we're in a place that's called the cancel culture. What are you talking about, Pastor? If they don't like what you say, they want to cancel you. How many of you know that truth offends today? Glory to God. And they're doing everything they can to cancel the truth. They do not want absolute truth. Oh, glory to God. Oh, we're in that place where people are not just lying, but they're withholding the truth in fear of persecution. We don't want to tell the truth, it seems like, anymore in our society. But I'm going to tell you, the Word of God still says it's a truth that will set you free. Praise God. Folks, I'm going to tell you, the church needs to be the place of truth. The Pharisees didn't like Jesus because he told them the truth. And it seems like today that we're getting a little soft-skinned. Glory to God, my grandma was thick-skinned. My grandpa was thick-skinned. You ever heard that saying before? Thick-skinned? It means they could take somebody and tell them the truth and they wouldn't get mad about it. Oh, but we can't tell nobody the truth anymore because it offends Glory to God, you listen to me. The word of God says, speak each man the truth to his neighbor. I'd rather somebody tell me the absolute truth and hurt my feelings. I'd rather somebody tell me the truth, Lord God, and help me correct what I'm doing than lie to me and tell me I'm all right. But we got so many pastors standing up in their pulpit today preaching fluff. Not 
preaching the truth because they don't want to offend anybody. They don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. They don't want to upset the apple cart because they're more concerned about the numbers and the money in the bank account. You know what we need to get back to? We need to get back to worrying about amen, growing people spiritually in God. Hallelujah. Not worried about the numbers sitting in the pews or the money going in the bank account. That'll take care of itself when we grow in Christ. Oh, somebody help me this morning. Glory to God. He said, speak every man the truth to his neighbor. The second command is give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace. The Lord said in Amos chapter 5 and verse 10, he said, they hate the one who rebukes in the gate. Listen to me. What are you talking about? It's referring how the people had entered a place where they despised law, justice, and authority. Sounds like a marriage today, don't it? Come on now. Truth and justice have fallen in the streets. People don't like authority anymore. Look, we're in this age of defund the police. There's no respect for authority figures anymore. Look at where we're at, folks. Jesus, the Word of God says you've got to give judgment in your gates. See, we need to understand that the city gates were the legal proceeding, is where the legal proceedings were held. The city gates was the equivalent of the modern day courtroom. Just look at our Supreme Court today, and you will see how justice in the gates is becoming a thing of the past. Oh, now, don't preach on current events, Pastor. We don't want to hear it. Preach us happy. No, I'm trying to get you ready for the rapture of the church. I'm trying to get you ready for what's about to happen. Because the next thing, come on now. I've heard people say time and time again, where I've heard preachers over my lifetime say, we're in the last minutes before the coming of the Lord. Let me tell you, time has sped up. I don't believe we're in the minutes no more. I believe we're in the very last seconds before the coming of the Lord. And we better know where we stand with Him. Glory to God. We better know where our life is with Him. Because He's coming in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Praise God. God. And those who are not ready will be left behind. Listen to me. Glory to God. All you got to do is go to court. How many of you remember that old saying? Innocent until proven guilty. Look, now it's the other way around. You see, people only need to see a video clip and they rush to condemn someone before a legal investigation is conducted and the evidence is presented. That's what we live in today, folks. Praise God. There's no justice. There's no peace. The third commandment. He said, let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor. You see, when someone despises the fact that his neighbor's a Christian and tries to get him arrested for attending church, you know, what are you talking about, Pastor? That's not happened here. It may not have happened here, but it's happened in other states. Look at New York. Look at California. There were people that were being arrested. Come on, look at down in Louisiana. Look down in Florida when all of this stuff started. There was pastors that were being arrested for having church. Come on now, I'm telling you folks, we're living in a world that despises the church. We're living in a world that despises God. Amen. Come on, we're living in a world that does not want to hear what the church has to say. Folks, we're living in a world where there's evil in men's hearts toward those that are good. But it's still time for the church to stand up in spite of what's going on and live for Christ. You see, we're living in a world where employees try to get co-workers fired for being Christians. You can't say nothing on the job side anymore. You can't. If you have conservative values, glory to God, when they try to get you fired... When I worked a secular job, Lord of God, one of the first things they said, this was back 10, 15, 20 years ago. They looked at us when they brought us in for orientation. They set us down and they said, there will be no religious talk in this plant. There will be none, Lord of God. There will be no praying in here. You are here to work. You are not here to serve God. I looked at them and I said, well, 
I said, I'm a preacher. And they said, especially from you. I said, well, let me tell you something. I said, whether you like it or not, you can't stop God. He's everywhere. And I said, let me tell you something. I said, I may not be able to open my mouth to somebody. I said, but God's going to send people to me. And when he does, I'm going to tell them all about the Lord. Amen. And I'll tell you, those tw- that 12 years I was in that plant, God sent person after person after person over to where I was at. Yeah, my boss kept an eye on me to see what I was doing. Glory to God. But I'm going to tell you, the little time I had, I got a chance to share Jesus with some people. Amen. In a place place where they did not want him but folks we're living in a time where we don't need to be thinking evil especially in the house of God toward one another we got folks in, in houses of God across the day that are sitting on one side of the church to the other side of the church that's got all in our heart toward one another how can God move in a place like that How can God minister in a place like that? How can God move on us? Uh, Amen. If we will not uh, forgive our brothers, uh, if we will not get that under the blood, how can God move in our services anymore? We won't let the evil go. The last command, he said, do not love a false oath. When I looked that up, it has several meanings. The first meaning is the ninth commandment found in Exodus 20 and 16, which says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. The other meaning is, uh, of this command is referring to how people are consumed with gossip. Uh-oh. Let me read you. Proverbs 26 and 22 says the words of a gossip are like tasty bits of food. People like to gobble them up. We just love juicy gossip, don't we? Oh, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. What's going on? Tell, come on now. And you know why we love gossip? I'll tell you why we love gossip. Because we want somebody to feel worse than we are. If we've always got somebody that feels worse than we, then we, we can set ourselves up a little bit higher. Woo! Somebody's always got it worse than I do. Bless God. But I want to tell you what we need to be doing. Praise God. If somebody comes to you and says, let me tell you what so-and-so done. What you need to do is stop them right there in their tracks and say, hang on just a minute. Let me get so-and-so on the phone because he needs to be or her needs to be in this conversation. You want, to stop, you want to stop a lot of gossip? Get the person that they're talking about on the phone with them. Or get them in their presence. That'll stop a lot of it. You know, we're awful big, bad, and brave, glory to God, when we're not in the presence of the person we're talking about. Woo, come on now. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm preaching better y'all amen in this morning. You see... Glory to God, we love gossip. We want gossip, glory to God. I want to tell you, rather than gossiping about somebody, how about we get in our prayer closet and start praying for them? Glory to God. How about instead of believing the worst about them, we start lifting them up, glory to God, and give them the benefit of the doubt instead of rushing to, to accuse them of anything, glory to God, and start saying, God, help them. God, touch them. Lord, if they're doing something wrong, you get a hold of them. I don't need to be this. I'm not their judge and jury. Praise God. But I'm going to pray for them, glory to God. Hallelujah. Because look at what the Lord says. He says, at the end of this verse, for all these things that I hate. For all these are the things that I hate. It goes right along with Proverbs 6, 16 and 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises evil plans, feet that are swift to running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who soars discord among the brethren. Now some of you may have been offended by that scripture that says God hates. Oh, you might have got offended learning that God hates. But let me tell you what Billy Graham said. Billy Graham says, We in the church have failed to remind this generation that while God is love, He also has the capacity to hate. 
He hates sin. And he will judge it with the fierceness of his wrath. This generation is schooled in the teaching about an indulgent, soft-hearted God whose judgments are uncertain and who coddles them who breaks his commandments. This generation finds it difficult to believe that God hates sin. I tell you that God hates sin just as a father hates a rattlesnake that threatens the safety and the life of his, ch- of his children. God loathes evil and diabolical forces that will put people down in a godless eternity. It's his love for men, his compassion for the human race that prompts God to hate sin with such a vengeance. And I want to tell you, if our father hates sin, guess what we should be doing? If we're supposed to be like him... We need to be hating sin also. Because let me give you a little, let me give you a little scripture. Lord God, Galatians 5.24 says, Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What are you saying, preacher? I'm telling you we need to understand that those who practice these things that God's hate will not inherit the kingdom of God. We also learn that those who practice these things do not belong to Christ. Well, that's awful hard to say, Pastor. That's scripture. See, but some of y'all just turned me off right there. Because we don't want to hear that no more. Folks, we're getting ready to go home. And he said, I'm coming after a bride without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. Let me, let me be real honest with you. He's not coming after a whore that's been running around with everything this world has to offer. Well, you can go ahead and clap if you're going to. Come on. Well, that's awful hard, Pastor. You hear me, glory God. How many of you men will put up with your wife running around with everything under the sun in this town? You wouldn't, would you? Christ said, I'm coming after a chaste bride. I'm coming after a bride that's made herself ready. I'm not coming after a bride that's, that's dabbled in this and dabbled in that. And glory to God. Her brother Joel told me, Lord God, we was out to, I think he may have said it during one of his sermons. Lord God, but he told me when we was out eating, he said, I had to put a family out of my church the other day. I said, you did? He said, yeah. He said, they was practicing witchcraft and didn't think there was nothing wrong with it. He said, I come to him. I said, you can't do that and think that you're right with God. He said, well, they said, well, pastor, we've done it all our life. There ain't nothing wrong with it, dabbling in the black magic. He said, get out of my church. Folks, I'm going to tell you, we got to stand up for the right, glory to God. We cannot sit here and tell people that anything goes anymore, glory to God. We've got to be right. we got to be holy if we're going to go home to be with the Lord. These are the things that we must do. Number two, the day of the Lord is coming. Look at your neighbor and say, the day of the Lord's coming. The day of the Lord's coming. That's what Nahum said. It's what Nahum means. The mountains quake before him, the hills melt, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it, who can stand before his indignation, who can endure the fierceness of his anger. His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. He's talking about the day of the Lord. It's coming. How many of you know it's coming? Glory to God. Let me tell you the reason why I believe that these two scriptures were found together is because Nahum is the response to Zechariah. These are the things you shall do. But should you fail, you can be sure that my justice is going to prevail, God says. You see, God's justice is going to be unleashed on the the world in the day the Bible calls the day of the Lord. You see, that term, the day of the Lord, occurs 25 times in 23 verses in the books of of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi, Acts, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and 2 Peter. Lord God, I want to tell you, the day of the Lord is described as a period of time in which God will deal with wicked men directly and dramatically in fearful judgment. 
You see, today, a man can be a blasphemer of God, an atheist. They can denounce God and teach bad doctrine, and seemingly God does nothing. But the day designated in Scripture as the day of the Lord is coming when God will punish human sin and will deal in wrath and in judgment with Christ, this Christ-rejecting world. One thing you can be sure of is God in His own way is going to bring every soul into judgment. If you're taking notes, you may want to take notes right here. Glory to God. The day of the Lord. There's a few things you need to understand about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a day of darkness. It's a day of darkness. What are you talking about? Zephaniah 1, 14 through 18. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There is mighty men. There, there, there the mighty men shall cry out. The day is a day of wrath. It's a day of trouble and distress. A day of devastation. Of desolation. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. But it's not only a day of darkness. It's a day. The day of the Lord is a day of destruction. It's a day of destruction. What are you talking about? Glory to God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 3, 1 through 3. Paul says, But concerning the time and the seasons, brother, you should have no need that I should write to you. For you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For then, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. It's a day of destruction. It's a day of despair. What do you mean a day of despair? Luke chapter 21, 25 and 26. Jesus is talking. He said, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth. Distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's heart failing them from fear. And the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Revelation 9 and 6. In those days men shall seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die. And death will flee from them. It's a day of despair. But it's also a definite day. What are you talking about, Pastor? It's a definite day. It's a day that's coming. Look at your neighbor and tell him it's a day that's coming. Look back at him again and say, are you ready? Glory to God. It's a definite day. 2 Peter 3. 3 through 10 says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Let me stop right there. Do you know that we're right there? Do you know that there are already people in this world who say Jesus ain't coming? Just like Joel said, it's Wednesday night. Glory to God. We've even got preachers standing up in church of God pulpits that say, I don't preach about the coming of the Lord no more. I don't preach about the tribulation no more. I don't believe it. They don't believe our doctrine. Let me tell you, let me tell you these people who are standing up saying this, they are signs that Jesus is coming. Praise God. For this, they willfully forget by the word of the Lord the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire under the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men but beloved do not forget one thing that the Lord that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. It is a definite day. I don't know when that day is. 
I just know it's coming. How do you know it's coming, Pastor? Because God said it. And God's not a man that he should lie. Oh, but I'm not going to end this portion of this verse, uh, uh, of this sermon on a, on a down note. But I want, you, I want to give you the last point I've got on, on this. It's this. The day of the Lord is a day of deliverance for the child of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. The day of the Lord is a day of deliverance. Uh, praise God for the child uh, of God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, uh, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, John 5, 24 said, Most assuredly, I say unto you, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me uh, has everlasting life and shall not come unto judgment, but has passed from death unto life. Uh, Revelation 3 and 10. Because you have kept my command to preserve I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth (laughs) oh somebody needs to give the Lord some praise right now because I'm telling you the next event on the calendar of heaven is the rapture of the church Hallelujah. (coughs) Whether you believe in the rapture or not, that's up to you. Glory to God. But I'm going to tell you, listen, I'm not going to debate people on the rapture of the church. There's, come on, there, I'm going to give you the, the church of God stance on where we are. We believe in the pre, the, the pre tribulation rapture of the church. We are pre-trib. There are people in this world that believe the church is not going to be raptured out till mid-trib. There are people who believe that the church is going to have to go all the way through the tribulation and be raptured out at the end, post-trib. Well, let me just tell you about post-trib. Why why in the world would the Lord uh, encircle the earth uh, just to pick us up and set us right back down? Why would we go mid-trib? Because the Word of God says that there is a marriage supper of the Lamb. That while the seven years of tribulation is taking place here, we're going to be at the seven years of the marriage supper of the Lamb in glory. Praise God. If you're mid-trib, hallelujah, that's only three and a half years. I got news for you. God's not cutting His time short. Whatever He said, He's going to do it. That's why I believe, uh, praise God, uh, just as the Word said, just as those scriptures I just gave you, amen, that we're about to leave this place. Uh, we're about to depart. Gravity's about to lose hold. Uh, and we're going home, praise God, uh, to be changed uh, in the moment and twinkling of an eye, praise God. There's deliverance. Well, I've heard people say, well, no. All right now, Pastor, but why did why is it in the Word of God for us to know about the day of the Lord if we're not going to be here for that tribulation period? Let me tell you why it's in there. Glory to God. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 11. When he came to the end of that scripture, he said, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? What's he saying? He's saying, since you see that these things are on the way, it ought to cause you to live a godly and holy life. To be ready for that day that the Lord descends with a shout and the archangel with a voice. Come on now, my Lord. I'm telling you folks, in light of what's coming, Peter was saying we need to consider whether we're living for God or not. Jesus even said, take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighted down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. And to stand before the Son of Man. Well, Pastor, how do you know that we're in these last days? Second Peter Chapter 2, 
verses 1 and 2, Peter gives a description of what these, last, uh, of what these days before the last day is going to look like. He said there's going to be false prophets among the people who are secretly, secretly going to be bringing in destructive heresies, uh, even denying the Lord. Uh, and many will fall, follow their destructive ways uh, because of whom the word of truth will be blasphemed. Uh, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, But know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men will be lovers of their own selves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, uh, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, heady, high-minded, uh, haughty, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. You see, folks... I believe that there are many today, like the Word of God talks about in Joel chapter 3 and verse 14. I believe there's some today in this place, in that place of Joel chapter 3, 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now think about that for a minute. In the valley of decision, the day of the Lord is near, but not yet. Why is that? Because it's saying there's still time. Time for what, Pastor? Time for you to get right with God and repent. You're in the valley of decision. You see, it's not an accident you showed up in this place today. Glory to God. God divinely ordered your steps into this. It's not an accident you're watching by live stream today. Glory to God, share this with people. I want it to go everywhere. Praise God. I want you to understand, folks, it's not an accident. God is saying, I'm getting my bride ready. I'm getting my church prepared for the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. Why? Because as Hebrews 10, 31 says, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. See, we don't use that scripture no more because we want God to coddle us and accept anything we do and love us any way we look. But it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And I think about it, Brother Mike, over and over and over again. What Paul said in Romans chapter 1. He said, if we keep rejecting God and rejecting God and rejecting God and turning away from His Spirit, that He's going to turn us over to a reprobate mind to do what we want to do, what we think is right in our own eyes. And we'll miss Him. And we'll miss His Spirit. And we'll miss what He's doing. Because we won't feel His Spirit no more. Now, I wonder how many are sitting in churches today that don't feel the Spirit of God any longer. Because we've rejected Him, turned Him away, said we're fine when we're really not. Because we're doing the things that He hates, because we don't see nothing wrong with them. God's saying the day's coming. The day's coming. Romans 6 and 23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Come on. Stand with me this morning. I want you to take just a moment. A time of reflection. I want you to take just a moment. A time of reflection. Look at me for just one moment. Look at my hands. I say this time and time again. Now, whenever I started preaching, I grabbed a hold of this scripture over in Ezekiel. It says, if the watchman does not warn the people, the blood of the people is on his hands. But if that watchman warns, blows the trumpet, and the people... Do not respond. Their blood 
is not required at his hands. My hands are clean this morning. And I stand here this morning. I didn't want to preach this message. I did not want to preach this message. But God burned it inside of me this last week. Because he said the time is near. I do not know how much more time we have. Glory to God. It does not say. It just says, glory to God, you need to look up because your redemption draweth nigh. Folks, we need to be watching. Jesus said, watch and pray. For you know not what hour the Lord doth come. Folks, I don't know where you stand with God today. I don't know where you are in your relationship with Him. But He's standing here calling you today. Saying, come. save you come I died for you I shed my blood for you I want to wash your sins away how many times has the Holy Spirit spoke to us in tongues and interpretation and said come I'm calling you I'm calling you I'm calling you some would respond some would not I'm telling you today folks God is calling and today he's going to show his love but there's coming a day that if we reject him there's a day we're going to see his wrath well you're just trying to scare me pastor I hope I am because let me say it one more time it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God this morning God is calling us to make sure that our relationship with Him is where it ought to be every head by our eye closed